Chapter 28 Disability Lawyer Ms. Scrooge, come on in, please, Dr. Rosedale announced to a waiting room full of patients. A woman in a long red coat grasped two ski poles from against the wall, planted them in front of her, and hoisted herself out of the chair with a sharp grunt. Breathing heavily, she shuffled stiffly toward Brad, following him into an exam room. Please have a seat. They faced each other across a small desk. On it was a stack of her medical records and a letter from the County Disability Benefits Office addressed to him. It was a busy day, so he started right in. Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Rosedale. I see that you were walking across a parking lot when a car struck you. From the letter, Brad knew the 48-year-old social worker had been claiming disability for five years after a car had struck her while she was performing work-related activity. Patty Scrooge glared at him. It came out of nowhere, going 35 miles per hour, hit me, and threw me into the air. I landed on the hood and bounced back on the street about 20 feet away, landing on my knees. She paused and gave him a heavy sigh. <sighs> my life has never been the same since that day. However, the letter summarized a witness statement wildly at odds with Ms. Scrooge's story. According to that statement, the car was moving slowly, and the front bumper made contact with Ms. Scrooge's legs, causing her to tump over, after which she got up and walked away without a limp. The letter also summarized a doctor's report to the effect that she was ambulating around the ER with a normal gait, and that her injuries were limited to abrasions on her legs, contusions. X-rays of the knees showed pre-existing degenerative arthritis. The only treatment necessary was to clean the abrasions and apply Band-Aids. She was discharged as stable and had walked out of the ER with a prescription for Motrin and a muscle relaxer. Brad knew not to alienate a patient this early in the evaluation. He had to earn her trust, which was always difficult when someone was seeking an insurance doctor. Mrs. Scrooge, I want to assure you that I am an independent examiner, and although I am being paid by the county you worked for, there is no pressure for me to decide in their favor. I've seen cases for them where I supported the patient's claim, and they had to provide full disability benefits. They just want an objective evaluation to help them close your claim. Can you please tell me how your knees worsened after the car hit you? You can't tell me the county is trying to play fair. That's why I got an attorney. And my doctor says I will need knee replacements because of this accident. She added, sobbing softly and avoiding the question. He reviewed her questionnaire, which consisted of 16 pages that had been exhaustively completed with notes added in the margins. She couldn't climb steps had constant pain that was scaled as 9 out of 10, was taking the opiate pain medication, Norco. And because of pain in her knees, she couldn't sit in a chair or stand for more than 10 minutes. Her activities of daily living scores were off the chart, indicating that she considered herself severely crippled, a shut-in who needed constant help and couldn't go out to socialize or travel. Do you consider yourself crippled, ma'am? He was wondering if the attorney had coached her. The questionnaire responses went way beyond what anyone could expect given that the accident happened so long ago. Well, I guess so. My life has been ruined since that day I got hit. Please have a seat on the exam table, Miss Scrooge. As if she were walking on eggs, she hobbled without her ski poles to the table and climbed up with a sharp moan. Brad had noted her odd gait. Does this hurt? He asked, lightly palpating a kneecap. She yelled out as if he were burning her with a hot poker and reached down, pushing his hand away. Can you straighten your knee out and resist me? She made a poor effort, then suddenly gave way, gasping and barely able to resist gravity. After a thorough but routine examination, punctuated with labored breathing and yelling, Brad's only valid objective finding was crepitus behind the kneecaps. And that was likely due to wear and tear from years of carrying around a body weight of 245 pounds. There was nothing to explain the severe disability she was claiming. I'm going to feel this for days. You hurt me. She stepped down off the table and waltzed over to sit in the chair. She moved so easy on her feet that he could no longer escape what would be his ultimate conclusion. Patty Scrooge was not disabled as a result of her auto-pedestrian accident. Yet, in the years since the injury, she had convinced three other doctors of just that. Brad had given her no indication that he would come up with a different conclusion from the other doctors, and she had let her guard down. The evaluation was essentially over. He took a few minutes to wrap things up. Remembering the patient complaint that the doctor, quote, didn't explain anything or tell me anything I needed to know, he recalled when he would, quote, reassure them and restore them to a sense of wholeness. He thought he would try it here. Maybe it would help her. 
I see you had a lot of pain during the exam, Ms. Scrooge, but your knees are stable. In my experience, you could benefit from exercising and losing some weight. What? She said, cutting him off, her face reddened. I've been heavy since I was a child, and my knees never bothered me before that car smashed them. Her irate response to his attempt to be helpful triggered a mild pushback. Brad decided there needed to be a little justice. Have you seen your medical records? By law, she must have been provided them. He flipped through the stack on his desk, which went back 15 years. Page after page reported knee pain and arthritis. At least one doctor had told her to lose weight. I never looked. My attorney has them, and he told me to let him handle everything. Why? What's in them? Her voice whined with suspicion. You were seeing doctors for knee pain and arthritis for years before this accident. One doctor told you, I don't remember. Ever since that terrible day, my memory has gone south. I think I must have hit my head when I landed in the street. Her response provoked him to get some additional details while trying to keep the edge out of his voice. But even he could hear his tone change. The lies and exaggerations had been nonstop, and he was only human. When he had all the information he needed to write the medical disability report, he took a deep breath and said in a measured monotone, I'm done here, Miss Scrooge. Thank you for putting up with all this. Take care of yourself. She lumbered out, stiff again, navigating with the ski poles, breathing laboriously. He submitted the 52-page report within the week, ending it with a scholarly explanation of why she wasn't eligible for work-related disability retirement. Months later, he took a call from the defense attorney on the case. Dr. Rosedale, Dennis Lamb here. I have Brandy Robbins on the line. As you know, we are representing the county retirement board in the Patty Scrooge case. Hello, doctor. This is Brandy. I'm the disability coordinator. The woman said. You are familiar with the case, assumed the attorney. No previous medical evaluation Brad had conducted had ever necessitated a three-way call. Something was up. Yes, the lady with the ski poles. Hard to forget. Bumped by a car. The emergency room doctor reported bruises and scratches and that she was walking around like nothing happened. She tried to pull one over on me. Falsified her story, exaggerated her complaints. She filed a formal complaint against you, doctor. She alleges that you were rude, called her fat, and didn't believe her account of the accident. Wow, said Brad. I probably shouldn't have told her that losing weight would be good for her knees, but I never used the word fat, and I'm never, ever rude to a patient. The death threat years ago, the threat of a bullet in his brain came to mind. He had been careful ever since to not give disability applicants any reason to go postal. But sometimes, as in this case, the truth needed to be laid down. That brings up her attorney, Roman Crandall. I know the guy, and he's a vicious piece of work. He probably fabricated the complaint and had her sign it. Now he's trying to get your report thrown out as bias so he can get a friendlier evaluator. But it is very credible, and I believe the judge will admit it into evidence. It is an excellent report and gives us a chance to overturn this wrongful claim, but... Brandy trailed off, her voice somber, as though she was holding back more bad news. This Crandall must be a sore loser, Brad said, trying to break the tension. He doesn't lose, said Dennis Lamb. That explained the three-way call. Ah, that's what they were doing. They were warning him. No, he doesn't. Mr. Crandall carries a strong vendetta against doctors who testify against his clients. A few years ago, he was successful in getting our expert's medical license suspended. That explained why Brad had received a sudden stream of referrals from their office. He had always wondered about that. The date of the hearing came and Brad arrived at the conference room early to set up a knee arthritis model, a scientific chart showing auto-pedestrian injury trajectories, and colorful posters of knee anatomy. Mr. Lamb arrived, and they reviewed their strategy. The judge ambled in, helped himself to the coffee urn, and stayed out of the way by engaging in small talk with the receptionist. Brandy Robbins walked in, observing on behalf of the county, and sat in a corner with her notes. The court reporter set up her equipment across from where the judge would sit. The clock struck 1 p.m., and everyone was in place except for Roman Crandall. Ten minutes passed, then 15. Brandy reached for her cell phone to call his office when the door to the conference room swung open, revealing Mrs. Scrooge, gripping her ski poles, her face contorted in pain. A hand adorned with a Rolex watch held the door as she trudged into the room. The wearer of the watch towered behind his grumpy client, and when he came into view, Brad noticed his tailored, gray silk suit punctuated by a burgundy tie and gold tie clip. Gold rings glimmered on his hands, and at least one was mounted with a shiny diamond. Glad to see everyone is ready, said Roman Crandall. No apology or excuse was offered for being tardy. 
Please make way for my client. She has been having a really tough time ever since that terrible accident. His voice was resonant and commanding. He directed his client to a chair across the table from Brad. She didn't need to be there. It was purely for drama and to play to the judge. Brad looked at Lamb, who was studying a cloud through the window, a faraway look in his eyes. Crandall sat next to Miss Scrooge and flashed a malevolent grin at Dr. Rosedale. Looking into Crandall's eyes, Brad felt a strange gut reaction, one that he couldn't identify. Suddenly, he felt uneasy. The judge swore in the expert witness, and Lamb launched into his direct examination. The defense attorney took Dr. Rosedale through all of the evidence. The doctor demonstrated arthritis on the model, showing that it wasn't caused by the accident. He used the chart to show that she couldn't have been thrown up into the air and flown 20 feet as she'd claimed. He ended with eloquent arguments against the accident as a cause of the woman's disability, which to a reasonable degree of medical certainty resulted from her obesity and pre-existing arthritis. He testified that the ER record was limited to scrapes and bruises, and the use of ski poles was not useful for knee arthritis. They were not weight-bearing devices such as a cane or crutch, but indications that she was dramatizing. He focused on his teaching materials and presented directly to the judge as Lamb had advised. Yet the evil and mocking stares of Crandall and Miss Scrooge crept into his peripheral vision and got on his nerves. Finally, it was time for Attorney Crandall to conduct his cross-examination. Your Honor, I move that Dr. Rosedale be excused from this hearing and that he be barred from ever doing expert witness work again in the great state of California. The judge could not hide his surprise. He lifted his elbows off the table and sat all the way back in his chair. Really, on what basis do you make this motion, Mr. Crandall? Defense Attorney Lamb rolled his eyes and focused on an empty corner in the room. Brandy from the county dropped her pen and bent to retrieve it. Roman Crandall narrowed his eyes at Brad, who had become his hated adversary. I am going to provide evidence that this so-called expert witness was biased in his attempt to perform an independent medical evaluation, that he injured my client during the examination, that he is incompetent due to mental problems, and that he has been blocked from doing IMEs in this state. I can vouch for the latter because I personally blacklisted him with the California Disability Lawyers Association. None of my colleagues will touch him now. His sonorous voice faded, but still somehow reverberated throughout the room. The judge was silent. Brad noticed Roman Crandall's chiseled features and hawkish nose, the way he clenched his fists while talking, and splayed his hands out on the table when he was finished. He looked into Roman's eyes again before the words had time to sink in. He was experiencing deja vu, a haunting, familiar feeling that he struggled to keep at bay. Then the reality of the situation chilled his soul. The man was a monster who was on the verge of destroying his livelihood. I object, Lamb said. It was a formality. He had nothing to object to yet. Noted, said the judge, as he flipped through the pages of the expert CV. Mr. Crandall, he is still your witness. Do you care to proceed with your cross-examination? Oh, yes, your honor. With pleasure. Dr. Rosedale, what were you doing in 1997? Brad paused and tried to recall. I was working. I had taken some time off for a break and decided to stop performing surgery, so it was an office-based practice. Brad's mind was reeling. It had been over 20 years since he went through his bankruptcy and depression. How could Randall know what he had gone through? It had all resolved with a happy ending. What was Crandall's game? Isn't it true that doctors diagnosed you with a mental illness and you were deemed incompetent to practice medicine? That you abandoned your patients, botched surgery, and declared bankruptcy because of your personal problems? Crandall stood, his gaunt six-foot, five-inch frame towering over the table. His eyes sparkled brightly and his neck veins bulged. He leaned forward, his fist clenched again, except for a big bony finger that pointed at Brad as he added, Isn't it true? that you aggressively examined my client, causing injuries to her knees, back, and hips. She had to go to the emergency room the next day for treatment from your examination. Isn't it true that you told her she was fat, called her a liar, and made her cry several times during what she called a torture session? He stopped the tirade and sat down, right as the judge began to interrupt. Mr. Crandall, I see you have an axe to grind with this doctor, the judge said. But please settle down and allow him to reply to your questions one at a time. Brad couldn't think straight, which was exactly what Crandall had intended. Doctor, you may answer, Mr. Crandall, said the judge. I object, said Lamb. 
counsel will have to offer some evidence to support these accusations, or I will report Mr. Crandall to the California State Bar myself. None of this has been entered as evidence, Your Honor. Objection noted, said the judge. Doctor, you may answer the questions. Crandall sat and smirked. Patty Scrooge looked at him as though she could hug him. Uh, which one? I don't know where to start. Burning inside, Brad suppressed a primordial urge to leap across the table and strangle Roman Crandall. To move the hearing along, the judge asked the court reporter to read back the questions, and Brad did an admirable job explaining or refuting everything. The judge overruled Crandall's motion to excuse the witness, but damage had been done. The doctor was not the stellar expert attorney Lamb and county coordinator Brandy had thought. Failing to completely discredit the witness, Crandall changed tactics, and the real cross-examination was underway. Smiling warmly at Brad, his pleasant tone belied his intent. Doctor! How can you sit there and tell the court that Miss Scrooge's accident wasn't disabling after at least three of your colleagues determined they were? Those colleagues were examining her for a worker's compensation claim, not for lifetime disability benefits. It's a different system with different rules and causation thresholds. Brad hoped the judge would see the sense in his technical explanation. Doctor, how can you say this injury didn't end her career when she was doing her usual job right up until her knees were traumatized, and now she can't walk a hundred yards without her walking sticks? Brad remained still, hands in his lap, letting his eyes drift from Crandall's insolent face to a spot on the table. He had spotted the illogical absurdities in Crandall's question and his misrepresentation of the facts, but struggled to verbalize a rebuttal. I need a break. He looked at the judge, then at Lamb. Can we chat in private for a minute? The judge allowed it, and Brad went out and entered a side room near the coffee urn. Dennis Lamb followed and closed the door. Brad was pacing back and forth. I tried to warn you about this, asshole, the attorney said. I am sorry to find out those things about your personal history. It's not a problem for me, but the board may decide not to use you again for our cases. Oh, thanks for that. On top of that bastard trying to shut down my career, you're already giving me the boot? Nice defense, Dennis. Brad paced the room once, breathed deeply, and quickly calmed. I'm not going to fight what I can't change. It will have to work itself out, but that's not what I wanted to talk about. I'm trying to win the case here. And how do you want to do that, said Lamb. How long has she been sitting there, with no effort to get up or change position because of knee pain? At least an hour, said Lamb. What's your point? I've got her original questionnaire with me. She marked that she can't sit for more than 10 minutes. There are other exaggerations, all described in my report. But Crandall has done a good job bringing anything I've said into question. Brad felt like a quarterback who had a surefire play to make the next touchdown. And Dennis wasn't getting it. I want the judge to see the questionnaire she filled out so he can see firsthand that she is lying right here at this hearing. You can't do that, said Lamb, smiling out of a corner of his mouth. The questionnaire hasn't been introduced into evidence. Can't we make a motion to get it introduced? After all that shit that Roman Crandall pulled against me, it's only fair. No. I'm not going there, said Lamb. I think you made your points. The judge allowed you as an expert, and I think he will consider the evidence fairly. In that moment, Brad saw Lamb for what he was. He simply had to play his part. His job was secure, and he was not invested in the outcome. Perhaps he had already assumed he would lose the case because of his poor record against Crandall. That explained how he could sit there calmly and look out the window while opposing counsel tore his expert doctor all up. The break ended and the trial resumed, and no thanks to Lamb, Brad rallied, giving his best rebuttals to Crandall's attacks on his medical conclusion that the auto-pedestrian injury could not have caused Batty Scrooge's disability. Following the hearing, the decision took quite some time. Ultimately, the judge sided with the three doctors who had found that the car bumper caused severe damage to Ms. Scrooge's knee joints and triggered a series of events that resulted in her being unable to work ever again. Ms. Scrooge would get a windfall of money with her early disability retirement and Crandall would get a big payday from his commissioner in the settlement. Lamb would get his usual legal fee and continue his job. Things would go on as usual for the county disability program. It was a small part of the $100 billion a year disability benefit system in California. Lamb had been correct. The county board dropped Brad from their list of experts, but he had one more evaluation for the county that had been previously scheduled. Dennis Lamb invited him for dinner to discuss their strategy, and Brad arrived at Izzy's Steakhouse on the peninsula where Lamb had reserved a secluded booth with a large table where he could spread out his notes. They started with a couple of pints of IPA. This is a 49-year-old firefighter who strained his knee six years ago, stepping off a fire engine, had arthroscopic surgery with no findings except inflammation, and now he's claiming he can't work. Lamb went through the case in more detail then stopped long enough to finish the pint. 
A basket of warm bread arrived, and the waiter took their orders. Is Crandall his attorney? Brad wanted to know. No, you're off the hook on that one. I feel bad that the county won't use you anymore and that this will be our last case together, but you'll never see Crandall again unless you run into him on the street somewhere. I did want to say thanks for the hard work you've done for us. That's what this dinner is all about, and here's a little something to take home. Lamb reached for a gift bag that had been on the seat near him and handed over a bottle of Hennessy. Thank you, Dennis. That's very nice. You weren't so bad to work with. I might actually miss these cases, except for Crandall. Some advice, though? Don't fight so hard. Doing disability cases in California is like cash on a conveyor belt. You just stick your hand out and grab the money as it goes by. Everybody gets paid. Seems you're right about that. I must have made 10 grand on the Scrooge case with the report, phone calls, and that half day getting mauled by Crandall. But I have to sleep at night. Are you suggesting that I soften up and give in or what? Work with the system. If you hadn't written such a thorough and scientific report in your mission to shut down Ms. Scrooge, he wouldn't have gone to so much trouble to get into your old personal records and put you on the blacklist. He must know someone in the government. I still don't know how he got access to your sealed records. Boy, it must have cost him. So tone it down? Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah. Think of it as the disability industrial complex. It takes care of everyone in it. Doctors, lawyers, patients but only if they play their parts. If you succeed in proving that someone is not disabled, it's bad for business, and you're not playing your part. Lamb was downing his second IPA, a strong beer, and probably saying more than he should have. It had been years since Brad had heard anything like it, and it reminded him of the time he had shared his death threat with an older colleague. The doctor had barked at Brad. Stop trying to do the right thing. Just give them what they want. Followed by a confession that it was one of his secrets to making a seven-figure income. The state had a lot of money to provide to those claiming disability and the stakeholders were intent on keeping it flowing. The steaks at Izzy's were hot and savory. The IPA gave a nice buzz, and after dinner, Brad put the bottle of Hennessy on the backseat floorboard of his new Lincoln MKZ and drove home carefully. Without the county referrals and because Crandall put him on the blacklist, Brad's sideline doing disability evaluations dwindled. In the meantime, he was able to up his patient load in the treatment clinic and maintain the flow of abundance. If there isn't any more wood to chop, you go look for another wood pile, or find a tree to cut down. After a while, though, the referrals began to increase again. He was good at work, after all. Patent Brandy Robbins said his reports were excellent. Good thing that the disability lawyer's blacklist wasn't the only measure of a doctor's worth. Overall, his anxiety during this period was allayed by the strength he had gained from his spiritual journey. Thoughts flowed with little effort, searching for solutions when needed, and finding them. It was just the stuff of life. And Roman Crandall? He had done his best to destroy Brad Rosedale, and it hadn't worked. The elders on the Big Blue Planet had gathered to watch Oman's onslaught against Numan on Earth. They had a feeling that it could come to this. Oman's Earth birth had not nurtured an ally, had not nurtured an ally for Numan. The fierce human competition could bring lessons to be learned and serve as catalyst on their spiritual journey however bad that might look in their human forms. Oman's choice to be born into the wealthy and powerful Crandall family had presented him with many opportunities to follow the path of negative polarity, the path of self-service. By becoming an advocate of accident victims who were badly in need of his services, he had resisted the temptation. But somewhere along the way, he had crossed the line, and with his new zeal to take down doctors who represented the defendant, he had advocated on a false claim, purely for selfish reasons.